This morning's scripture reading is Psalm 95. That's page 609 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 95. Follow along as I read. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are his people, pasture of the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Manasseh, Massa, when the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said, They are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, Truly they shall not enter into my rest. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing. If you would turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. We are continuing our study in this great epistle, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Let me read these verses to you. Verse 1, for this reason we must pay close, much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. We need to hear it. We need it, Father. And we pray that your spirit will guide us through and give us understanding as we examine this passage. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great truths in these verses. Great truths for us to later carry to the communion table. Last week, we looked at chapter 1. We learned some great truths about Christ. The writer of Hebrews gave us what theologians call a Christology. Teaching about Christ, truths about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know about Christ, read Hebrews chapter 1. If the cults come at you during the week, if the cults come up to you and tell you things about Christ that are not true, you will recognize it. You'll know why it's not true. Because Hebrews 1 tells us who the true Christ is. Paul says in the last days, false Christ will arise. People claiming to be the Christ, preaching about a Christ, Understand and ask God to help you get your mind around Hebrews chapter 1 so you'll know who the true Jesus Christ is. We saw that laid out for us in those verses last week. Writing to this Jewish community made up of both believers and unbelievers and those who are sort of sitting on the fence, those who are intellectually convinced that Christ is who he said he was, Paul is, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews is seeking to tell them that the old covenant the old covenant is incomplete and that the new covenant is the fulfillment of the old covenant, that Jesus Christ fulfills the old covenant. All of those types and all of those ceremonies and all of those pictures and all of those shadows and all those rituals of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. Don't go back to the shadows. Don't go back to the types. Don't go back to the ceremony and the ritual. Go to come to Christ. This verse, these verses in 2, 1 through 4 are a warning, a warning passage. There are six warning passages in the book of Hebrews. I mentioned that to you in our introduction a couple months ago. 
It's not just enough to know about Christ. The writer of Hebrews is giving us warnings throughout the book. You can't just know the information. He says you must embrace and trust and commit yourself to Jesus Christ. It's like the guy who believes a boat will hold him, but he never gets in the boat. You follow me? You can know all the facts, know all the information. You can recite the gospel backwards and forwards. You can quote verses from the Bible. And yet, you can miss the gospel completely. One commentator said it this way, Hell is full of people who were not actively opposed to Jesus Christ. They just drifted there. These people, they know the truth. They even believe it. They even believe it. They're well aware of the gospel, but they're not willing to commit themselves to it. They drift past it into eternal disaster. Think about that. I believe there are people in this church like that. I believe there are people in American Christianity like that who they know all the information, and they don't hate Christ. They're not uh, actively opposed to Jesus Christ. Maybe you come with your wife or your husband or someone else week after week, and you wonder if they really get the picture of who Christ is. It's easy to know all the information. It's easy to know all the facts and to be able to recite all the things about Christ and to miss him completely and that is the warning that the writer of Hebrews is giving to these to this Jewish community I think what he's saying is folks quote there are believers in hell there are believers in hell people who believe it they just never embraced it they let it drift on by notice verse 1 for this reason that takes us back to chapter 1 right to the things he's just said in chapter 1. Therefore, you see this in the writing of the New Testament many times. Um, this is information that is given in chapter 1. Now, it demands a response. That's much of the New Testament. You see it in the book of Ephesians, three chapters of doctrine. Therefore, chapter 4 says, Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. You see it in the book of Romans. 11 chapters of doctrine. And then finally you come to chapter 12, and he says, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. That's what this is. You've heard the message about Christ, chapter 1, and now he says, don't let this drift by, don't drift by this message. Embrace it. Embrace it. You saw in chapter 1, you saw back in verse 2 of chapter 1, he is called the Son, he is the heir of all things, he is the one who made the world. You see, in chapter 3, he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. You see that he purged our sins. He made sinners acceptable to God. You see in verse 4 that he is better than the angels. To the Jews, that's important because they really respected and revered the angels. Verse 5, he is called the son. He's called the protocost, the chief of all creation. Verse 6, the angels worship him, not the other way around. Verse 7, the angels are called servants. He's called a son. They serve him. Verse 8, key verse on the deity of Christ. He is called God who is eternal. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He has given attributes, ascribed, attributes of God are ascribed to him. He's unchanging. He is the creator. He is anointed above all others. That's Jesus Christ. And that demands a response. This is not just something you can passively sit by and not respond to. In fact, you can't. You either embrace it or you drift by. If he's going to convince, if the writer of Hebrews is going to convince the Jewish audience that the new covenant is greater than the old covenant, then he must show them, he must show them that the mediator of the new covenant is greater than the mediators of the old covenant. And the mediators of the old covenant were angels. 
And Jesus Christ, he is saying, here is greater than the angels because of all those reasons we just saw. The word we in verse 1, we, the writer, the writer identifies himself with, these, with his audience. This is interesting. Who is he writing to? Is he writing to believers or unbelievers? I think that this passage can serve as an exhortation to us as believers. I think it's a warning to unbelievers. I think it's a warning to believers. I think it's a warning to unbelievers. I think that to those who are believers, it's encouragement in their sanctification. It's, it's reminding them of the gospel. It's reminding them of the source of their power to live the Christian life. It's kind of like if God told you as a Christian, you're going to go from Tallahassee to Miami. You're going to get there. You're going to get there. Your debt arriving at the destination is assured. But as you make that trip, and many of you have, you will know there are signs all along the way. There are warning signs. You better go this way. You better go that way. You better not speed. I mean, there are warning signs all along the way, right? And by faith, you stay on that path and you obey those signs all along the way. Those warnings, whatever they are. It's kind of like they serve as a reminder to us about our salvation and, our sanctific- and encourage us in our sanctification. But to those who are unbelievers, this is a solemn warning. To those who are professors but not possessors, this is a solemn warning. You must change. You must trust him. So it's got an emphasis on justification, an emphasis on sanctification. So there's a message here for believers and unbelievers. You know, we just sang a song, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I drift. I drift. My heart's like that. I need the reminder not to drift. I need the warning not to drift. There's some days I don't look or feel like a Christian. I need warnings like this. Many who are Christians need the the reminder to maybe to evaluate and examine themselves. So there's a strong warning here of sanctification as well as a strong warning. And I think primarily the warning is to unbelievers primarily to those who maybe are intellectually convinced about who Christ is, but are letting it drift by. I think that's the primary warning to the audience to whom this warning is for. We must pay closer attention. We must, we must uh, abundant attention to what we have heard. Everything depends on it, he's saying. If you miss this, you've missed everything. Now, he tells you six reasons in this passage, or five reasons in this passage, why we must give it our utmost attention. And let me point these out to you. In verse 2 and 3, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Listen, he's saying there that the gospel is greater than or more important than the law. The gospel is greater or more important than the law. If the old covenant was spoken by angels, he said, then nobody can got away with breaking the old covenant that was brought by angels. Do you think you're going to get away with breaking the new covenant, which was brought by the Son? That's what he's saying. He's going from the lesser to the greater. He's talking about two covenants in these verses. Some people think that because God is a God of grace, that he is not a God of justice. See the word every, the word every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty? Everything? There's no escape from the law of God in the Old Testament. There were many prescriptions, many principles laid out in the Old Testament. And every one of them were binding. And if you could not 
escape that, if you could not escape the justice of God for violating that, how will you escape the justice of God for violating the new covenant who was brought and mediated by his own son? See the word if in that verse, verse 2? That is a, in the Greek, a fulfilled condition. It's not a maybe. It's a fact. Every violation of the law was punished. Every violation. The law was important. That's the point. The law was important and violations were judged. In the Old Covenant, if you broke the law, the law broke you. That's the point. The law was given to show us that we were sinners. The law was given to show us our sinful condition. And to violate the law of God brought about the wrath of God. It's unalterable. You could not change it. And doing what it, disobeying what it said brought consequences. Go to Le- Leviticus 24. Let me just give you a, a sampling of some of this. Leviticus chapter 24. Hold your hand in Hebrews and go to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 14. He says in verse 14 of Leviticus 24, it's the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, it's the third book of the Bible. Verse 14 of 24 says this, Bring the one who has cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. By the way, back in uh, Hebrews 2, don't turn back there, but unless you can, there's two, there's two uh, types of sin mentioned. There's the word transgression and the word disobedience. Transgression refers to a willful act. Uh, here's the line, you cross it, you'll pay the consequences. That's a willful act. You draw the line, step over it. You break the law. Then there's the word disobedience, which is a sin of neglect. Uh, So you have sin of commission, sin of omission. I should have done something and I didn't do it. You see that in verse, back in verse 2 and 3. The the, interesting in the Old Testament law that it had, you're still guilty for either one, but they had certain requirements regarding those. Talk about that more later. But uh, in verse 24, Chapter 24, verse 14. Bring the one who is cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. Verse 15. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Turn to Numbers 15. Let's just stay in the, 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 the Pentateuch here and look in Numbers 15, 30. Numbers 15, 30. But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is, a, whether he is native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among the people, his people. Verse 31. Because he has despised the Lord The word of the Lord has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be on him or will be on him. Turn to chapter 25. This is just a sampling of the old covenant that was unalterable. The old covenant that was brought by, mediated by angels, given to us by God through angels. The old covenant that when you disobeyed it, it brought about a just penalty. Look in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 5. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord. So the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal the Peor. And finally, go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. 
Actually, it's not finally. But Deuteronomy 17, verse 2, If there is found in your midst, in any of your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you, a man or a woman who does, who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God by transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun of, or the moon, or any of the heavenly hosts, which I have not commanded. And if it is told you and you have heard of it, then you shall inquire, inquire thoroughly. Behold, if it is true and the thing certain that this detestable thing has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out that man or that woman who has done this evil deed to your gates. You shall stone them to death. Why? Verse 13. Then all the people will hear and be afraid. Put fear of God into everybody when people realize how holy God is and how just He is when you step across His line and violate His law. He is a just God. He has a holy law. In Deuteronomy 27, you don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 27 says, Cursed is He who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. That's Deuteronomy 27, 26. Jude, verse 5, listen to this. Now I desire to remind you, Jude, in the New Testament, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. People don't like to think of God like this, but God has a law and to violate his law is a sin, and the wages of sin is death. And that is the picture that is given to us throughout the Old Testament. It was unalterable. You could not change it. You could not compromise on it. There were no exceptions to the rule. The sacrificial system came about. The Day of Atonement and all the sin offerings came about. So God could hold back his justice. He was still a just God, but he would hold back his justice, hold back his wrath, by looking at the blood of an animal. Your disobedience deserves death, he would say. Your disobedience demands a holy justice, he would say. And I would look at the blood of an animal as a sacrifice in your place. And you would take on, though that animal was pure in the sense of animal, how the animal could be pure, I would take that animal's purity and put it on you. And I'll take that, your sin, and put it on that animal. And God would judge. That's, that was the justice of God. Of course, in the, it was a picture, a picture that one day, one day he would do fulfill in Christ. You know, one thing I battle with sometimes when I get up and talk to you is how to communicate to you the holiness of God. I don't even know how to start on that one. I'm, I'm so far from it. You're so far from it. We don't totally understand how holy God is. We look at all this in the Old Testament and go, how could God do that? It's because we do not understand how holy he is. We really don't grasp the holiness of God. Without sin, totally pure, we don't grasp that. And when we read that some of these things are foreign to us, we can't understand them. We look at all the blood in the Old Testament. And the reason for all the blood in the Old Testament that's been shed by sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice is because God is holy. He is holy. And sin, there can be no sin in his sight. He is holy. That's why in verse 3, go back to Hebrews. He calls our salvation a great salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, he calls our salvation a great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Because Christ fulfilled the law. Christ kept the law. The law that you and I could not keep, he kept. He did not come to abolish the law. He didn't come to get rid of the Old Testament. He came to fulfill the law, to live the law. He came to live and to be the righteousness of God. I need righteousness, folks. You need righteousness. The old covenant made me aware of the fact that I don't have it, and I can't get it on my own. 
The new covenant says it's a gift from God in Jesus Christ. He was righteous. He kept the law perfectly. He fulfilled the holy demands of God. And that's why it's called a great salvation. And he provides that righteousness to you and to me as a gift by faith in what he has done on the cross. The word salvation means to be rescued from something. You follow that? A great salvation. It means that I'm rescued from the wrath of God. That's what it means. When we talk about salvation, that's what we're talking about. You're rescued from the wrath of God. God is a wrathful God. He's a loving God, yes. He's a just God, yes. He's a compassionate God, yes. But he is also a God of wrath for sin. And salvation, it's not an economic salvation. It's not a political salvation. It's not all these salvation things you hear about. It's a salvation is about being rescued from the wrath of God. It's salvation from the penalty of sin, which is death, eternal separation from a holy God. Hell is very real. Understand that. Hell is very real. Jesus said more about hell than he said about heaven. You know that? Here's some of the things he said. He called it an everlasting fire. He called it a place where the worm does not die. He called it a bottomless pit, an outer darkness. He called it a furnace of fire. He called it a blackness of darkness. He called it a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is real. You see, if Christ is uh, to be admired, then he would have to be because he tells the truth. If he lied about that, then he shouldn't be admired by anybody because he said so much about it. And salvation, the cross that he came to die on, was about rescuing men and women from the wrath of God. They don't have to go to a place like that. That's why it's called a great salvation. And there's no escape any other way. If you neglect that, you face hell. You face hell. Second reason that we should pay close attention, we find in verse 3, the second half of verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 2, because it was spoken by the Lord himself. This message came from Christ himself, this message of salvation. Uh, He's the one that spoke it uh, first in Matthew 4, 17. Jesus began to preach the kingdom. You don't have to turn there, but he, he said, repent and believe. See your lost condition. That's what he was saying. See your lost condition. A physician doesn't come for people who are well. He comes for people who are sick. I'm the great physician. See your condition, your sick condition, and repent and believe. You are violators of God's holy law. You need to turn to Christ. That's what his message was. Mark 1.14, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, the good news of God. The good news of God is you can be saved from the wrath of God. That's the good news of God. The the good news is that God is just and he is holy. And the son takes that just penalty on himself in your place. Turn with me to John 6. I could look at a lot of passages, but let's go to John 6. I, I really like what Jesus says in John 6. In John chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus says this, John 6, 51. He says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. Now, he's using a metaphor here, calling himself bread. And it's interesting. You need need physical food to sustain yourself physically. But to sustain yourself physically, Spiritually, you need spiritual food. That's the metaphor that's being talked about here. Food, bread. Jesus, when he says, I'm the bread of life, he's not saying I'm a literal loaf of bread. No, he's saying, I'm the spiritual food that sustains you spiritually. Just like a loaf of bread sustains you physically. He says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, notice, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the word, 
world is what? My flesh. My flesh. This is when the Jews get literal. The Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, unless you commit yourself, that's a total commitment, folks, to eat something and drink something. You have no life in yourselves. Your religious system will not save you. Your works will not save you. Your emotions and feelings will not save you. There's nothing in yourself that will save you. You have no life in yourself. You can't produce this life where I'm talking about, Jesus is saying. You can't find this life apart from me. You can't have this life apart from me. He who eats my flesh, verse 54, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread, notice, will live forever. It's not Jesus plus anything else, folks. It's not Jesus plus going to church and Jesus plus giving money and Jesus plus trying to be a good person and Jesus and any. It's none of that. It's Jesus alone that gives eternal life. It's not Jesus plus your emotional experience. You can cry a lot. You can. All those things is not going to save you. It's Christ. It's embracing Christ. This is the message that he preached. This is the message of the new covenant. We go to him as bankrupt beggars. We go to him hungry, hungry for the bread of heaven. It's not your religious system. And I I think about so many people that are caught up in a religious system and thinking that religious system makes them okay with God. I think of so many people who think, and as much as we say salvation is not by works, I think of so many people who are caught up in works, who are caught up in religious activity and thinking that makes them okay with God. And they have never eaten of his flesh and drank of his blood. I'm not talking about taking the act of communion. I'm talking about embracing him and committing themselves to him. Talking about something that happens inside transformation that takes place inside as a result of being one with him. Third thing he says in verse 3, they were confirmed by the apostles. Confirmed by the apostles. These were second generation believers or second generation audience in the book of Hebrews. The apostles had already come on the scene and, and had preached to a generation, and this is another generation, and, and so they, some of the apostles, the apostles are not on the scene at the time, but men, some have died because of the gospel. But the point I want to make here is that these were just plain, ordinary guys, plain, ordinary people. They could have never made up this message that they tried. This is not the kind of message you make up to try to attract people. Our gospel is not popular. To to say one, they start out with the fact that God is holy, he is just, and he sees you as a sinner lost and destined for hell. That just doesn't come across real popular. But that is, when you start with God, that is what he sees the condition of man. And that man is in need of a savior. He's in need of repentance. He's in need of forgiveness. He's in need of righteousness. They couldn't have made this message up. But this is the message that they preached. A Savior that came into the world, lived and died and rose from the dead and suffered greatly. They, you know what it was, though? They couldn't stop the message. It just spread and spread and spread. As unpopular and as difficult sounding as it was, it didn't tickle anybody's ears. It didn't come across as, a, as something that you would 
put up on a billboard and say, repent and believe and deny yourself and take up your cross and it wouldn't make a terrible movie. I mean, there was just nothing about it that was popular. And these men preached it and proclaimed it and they were willing to die for it. Stephen in Acts chapter 7, very courageous. If you want to turn to Acts 7, we'll just look at a few verses there. Acts 7 Just starting in verse 51. This is how to win friends. Verse 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Verse 51 of Acts 7. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of you, the prophets, did your fathers persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become, you who received the laws ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. It says, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named, look, Saul, later became Paul. Wow. Wow. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. On that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. See that? Went about preaching the word. Christ taught it first, and then these men taught it. These women taught it. Proclaimed it. We preached the word under great persecution. Where did that courage come from? They had heard the message from the Lord. Those who had heard the message from the Lord passed it on to them. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, you must give attention to this message. Fourthly, it was confirmed by signs and wonders and gifts of the Spirit. We see this in verse 4. God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. When Jesus Jesus preached, he did unbelievable things, didn't he? He healed, he raised the dead, he calmed the sea, he did all kinds of miracles, cast out demons. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 37, he says this, talking to the Pharisees, "If, if if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though though you do not believe me, believe the works. You see that? The works proved who he was. The works proved that he was from God and that he was God. The works confirmed his message as being from God. The miracles were a confirmation of that. John 3, 2 says, this man, Jesus, Nicodemus, Uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John chapter 3. He says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Not only did Jesus, was Jesus able to perform miracles and signs and wonders, we're told in Acts 14.3 that the apostles were able to perform signs and wonders. It says, therefore, they spent a long time there speaking, Acts 14.3, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Keep in mind, there's, they have no Bibles, okay? They have no scripture. And the confirmation that the words they were speaking were true was the fact they could do these signs and wonders and miracles giving evidence to the fact that this message was from God. It looked just like the ministry of Christ. It's a confirmation. 
These signs and wonders and gifts were given to the apostles, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. These sign gifts verified and confirmed the message that the apostles were preaching. God testified to the fact that their message was true. Because you see, the, the apostles are the foundation of the church. It is their teaching that is the foundation of the church. And the evidence that they were speaking for God was they were able to perform these signs and wonders and miracles. God was testifying with them, verse or says, the question is, does that still happen today? And we've talked about this on other times, and does God still do signs and wonders and miracles? Does God still do these sign gifts? The list of gifts are found in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. Um, we are a charismatic church in the sense that we believe in spiritual gifts. That's what the word means. But we do not see, in terms of these sign gifts, Healing and tongues and interpretation of tongues, tongues being a foreign language that were given to the people in Acts chapter 2 to preach the gospel, a sign for unbelievers, we're told in, Acts, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We don't see that happening like it did then. The point I'm making is this. Does God heal? Yes, he does. Does God perform miracles? Yes, he does. He does that today. But in terms of what we see in the New Testament with the apostles and, and some of their close associates and the ministry of Christ, we don't see that happening today. You can't say that's happening today. If somebody tells me they had the gift of healing, I'm going to send them to TMH. I'm going to send them to a nursing home. I'm going to send them someplace where they can heal some people because that's exactly what you had going on in the time of Christ. If you're going to do it the New Testament way, and if you're going to treat the gift of tongues like it truly was defined in Acts as a foreign language, as a language they did not previously know, not a prayer language, that's messing with the scripture to come up with that, but as a known language, it says it, it better look like the New Testament if that's the case. And I just say to you, that's not going on today. I don't see that happening today. Does God healing people? Yes, he is. Does God doing miracles? Yes, he is. But to say someone has that gift, I would highly question that in the New Testament sense. But it, certainly God can do all kinds of things. We certainly don't want to limit God. I just want to talk biblically on this matter because it's a very confusing matter in the church today. The apostles had foundational gifts. It was very important. They were verified and authenticated in terms of their message because we have the apostles' teaching today. And we ascribe to the apostles' teaching the word of God. Notice the final point I want to make here. Back to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, you can miss this. You can miss this. It's a real possibility that you can miss the gospel. You can miss it. Verse 1 says, For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we will, would not drift away from it. Verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See the word um, drift away from it and neglect? Very similar words. Very similar words. The emphasis is not so much on rejecting it, but neglecting it. See that? And there's a difference between the two. We must savingly embrace it because you can miss it. You can miss it. Maybe some of these Jews had made a profession, but there was no possession. It's a solid warning that you can make a statement and it not be really what's going on in your heart. A lot of people say, as I told you earlier, I believe. But that doesn't mean that something that's taken, any change has taken place in their heart. You can drift away. The point is this. In the ancient Greek, it meant to pass or to flow by it. The idea is you've got this safe harbor. You've got this safe harbor. 
That's sort of the idea of paying much closer attention. You've got this safe harbor, but the sailors are drifting by their ship. They're not steering it into the harbor. They're letting the current just carry them away from the safety of the harbor. That's the idea of this. They're neglecting to, to do what's necessary to get into that safe harbor. You see, we have to anchor our souls in the safe harbor or we'll drift out into the ocean. We'll drift into the storm. We'll drift into the rocks. That's the idea of this. That's the nautical terms here. It's close attention, not neglecting. You can sit here, my friends, and you can just hear it and become numb to hearing it. You can sit here, my friends, and repeat it all back, but it never make any difference in your life. You can be a professor, but not a possessor of it. Listen to uh, something I read in John MacArthur's commentary on Hebrews. He said this. He talked about a, a woman that he shared the gospel with. Listen to this. He says, I'll never forget on one occasion when a lady came into my office and informed me that she was a prostitute. And she said, I need help. I need help. My life is a wreck. I said, and I said, I guess you do. And she said, please, I'm desperate. And so I presented the claims of Christ to her from beginning to end. And I said, would you like to invite Jesus Christ into your life? And she said, yes. And she said, I've had it. I'm at the bottom. I've been into the dope scene, uh, the whole bit. She prayed a prayer and invited Christ into her life in that prayer. And then I said, I want to ask you to do something. When she was through praying, I want to ask you to do something. I said, do you have your little book with all your contacts in it with you? And she said, yes, I do. He says, well, let's just take a match and burn that thing up right now. And she looked at me and she said, what do you mean? I said, just what I said. I mean, if you're really going to live for Jesus Christ and you've really accepted his forgiveness and you really met him as your savior, let's just burn that book and we'll just have a little party here and praise the Lord. And she said to me, well, that's worth a lot of money. She said, it's an awful lot of money. I said, well, good. And then she said to me, I don't want to burn my book. She put it in her purse and looked at me in the eye and said, I guess I don't really want Jesus, do I? And she left. When it comes down to nitty-gritty, people aren't willing to pay the cost. And I suspect they become one of the soils that Jesus warned us about. They'd receive the word, and they'd be taken away. You see, you can have a decision without a conversion. Understand that. A decision does not mean a conversion has taken place. I've heard that from so many people. I prayed a prayer, but my outlook on life was no different. First James 2.14 says that faith without works is dead. You tell me you believe, well, you've got demon faith so far. Demons believe, and they shudder. But faith without works is dead. And the evidence that faith is a saving faith is the works that follow. It's not the works that save you, but it's the works that are evidence of saving faith. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Listen, when you share the gospel with somebody, let them know that that's what Jesus is going to ask them to do. Because he is. That's not some second tier experience for Christians. Jesus was saying that to an audience of unbelievers. That is what he says to all of us. I grew up in this generation when I was a young Christian what you would do is you'd share the gospel with somebody and you'd have them pray a prayer and then when through praying the prayer, then you would say, okay, you're in the kingdom now. Okay, never doubt again. Okay, you're in, you're saved. I was saying that to them. They weren't saying that to me. And I realized, folks, you cannot see true faith. You cannot see justification. You cannot see regeneration. You cannot see what's going on in their heart. And you can't tell somebody that simply because they made a decision. You can't tell somebody that. 
The best you can do is you can say, this is what you can expect if you truly repented and you truly believe and you truly embrace Christ. And you can take them through 1 John. You're going to have a love for the other believers. You're going to have a love for the Word of God. You're going to have a love for others. You're going to have a desire to grow. You're going to have a desire to, to read your Bible. You're going to have a desire for things that you never had a desire for before. Those are things you will see if you truly repented, if you truly believe, if there's truly been justification in your heart, if God has truly regenerated you and saved you. That's the best you can say. You cannot say that somebody who made a decision is a Christian. You can't say that. Jesus said, go into the world and make decisions or find decisions. He didn't say that. He said, go into the world and make disciples. Then what does he say? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Now listen, if you tell me somebody made a decision and they don't want to get baptized and they don't want to be taught anything, you've got to question this decision, right? Because the goal is not a decision. The goal is a disciple, a follower of Christ. And I believe many have made decisions and they're keeping their trust in a decision and not in justification, not in a commitment to Christ, a true commitment to Christ. Jonathan Edwards wrote a great book. It's a hard read, but it's a great book called Religious Affections, and he identified what a true conversion would look like in a believer. He did this because so many cults were arising uh, after in the the revivals in New England back in the 1700s. He writes this book so people could distinguish the true from the false. So he writes this book called Religious Affections and shows what, based on the scripture, what the true affections of a believer are according to the Bible. A hatred of sin, a growing hatred of sin, a desire to change, a love for the scripture, all the things I said to you earlier. Let me close with this. Turn to Romans 10, verse 9. When I was in Haiti, so many of the pastors were telling me of people in their church who would come to get biblical counseling from him. He would tell me some of the things they were doing and involved, and I said, well, I said, man, I'd, I'd back up, and I'd just ask them, if they, find out if they're really a Christian. Before you start laying out biblical principles to somebody, you want to know that they've got the Holy Spirit indwelling them and they'll even listen to biblical principles, right? I tell you, you don't try to biblically counsel a non believer. You evangelize a non believer. You share biblical principles to those who have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in their life who value these things that are said in God's Word. And I think, and I think, I said, I'd take them to this verse. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that you can, this is what a Christian is. He is one who has confessed with his mouth that Jesus, listen to this, is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead. You see that? Jesus is Lord. That he is boss. That's what it means. I got a new boss in my life. That's a Christian. I got a new boss in my life. And I think a lot of people, that's the part they don't want to hear. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to get out of their desperate situation. But not everybody wants to call Jesus their Lord. But that's what he's asking. He's not asking you for you to decide that later on down the road. He is calling you to that. He'll be, his, he'll be your Lord. I think we leave that out. Because that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your, notice, in your heart, not just intellectually, but in your heart. God raised him from the dead, we say, belief must come from the heart. He's saying, he comes as Savior and Lord. And listen, the question is, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The answer to that is you can't escape. You cannot escape. You cannot escape. Back in Hebrews chapter 2, you cannot escape. If you're casual about this, then you will face judgment. Second Thessalonians says, dealing out retribution to those who do not believe the gospel. Let me close with Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. 
Referring to the Old Covenant, he says in verse 28 of Hebrews 10, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy. If you just, if you just neglect the law of Moses, you'll die without mercy. Verse 29, how much severe punishment do you think you will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which, by, which he has, was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. In verse 31, he ends with these haunting words. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I hope you're challenged by what you've heard this morning. Hey, I didn't write this, by the way. God wrote this. God breathed this. It's a narrow way. It's not an easy, broad way. It's not popular. It's not tickling your ears or my ears. God sees the condition of my heart. He knows what it takes to break this thing up. He knows what I need to hear from him to get me out of my comfort zone and to get me thinking deeper than I want to think. I would much rather come to church and not be challenged. I'd much rather come to church and not be upset. Rod, make me feel good when I come here. I want to walk out with pleasant thoughts. I understand that. I wish I could say that sometimes too. But these are God's words, and they're hard words. But I don't want somebody sitting here, sitting here and drifting into hell. Because that's possible. It's a real reality, a real possibility. Embrace Christ. Turn to Christ. Make sure you know him. Make sure you know him. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.